Black Widow getting her ass beat. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Guess what, Rob? What's up? I finally figured out what movie I was talking about with the garbage disposal. And I was wrong. There was no telekinetic teenager. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So remind everyone what you're referring to with this scene. This is from last week, right? Or last episode. Right. So last time we chatted, I was just talking about how I hated reaching into the garbage disposal and it always makes me think about this movie. It is actually Amityville Part 4, and the thing that makes the garbage disposal turn on is an evil lamp. Lamp, you Sorry, said? I hit the P. Yeah, I hit the P real hard, but it's <sighs> lamp. An evil lamp from the original house um, is like turning things on, and I don't know where I got this uh, evil child from, but yeah... So I, I figured it out. I found it. Uh, flashback to childhood. However, it made me think. This happens to me often where I'm trying to recall a movie. And sometimes I don't get the details right, but I do my best. I thought maybe it would be fun to challenge the listeners and give them a little reward. I don't know what that reward is yet, but calm down. It's not cash. I'm not pulling out my pockets just yet. You know, we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But I will do something special. I will make you something special. So I have another movie. And I don't know what it is. I've tried and tried to find it. We'll see if someone can figure it out. Quick little description. It's a period piece. I don't know, 16th, 17th century. A witch is being executed. She's evil. Maybe they stone her at the beginning of the movie. And then at some point in the movie, she starts to possess her daughter, who, you know, she's, of course, this beautiful blonde thing. And whenever she possesses her, her voice gets, like, real deep, um, and it sounds silly. And that's all I got. <laughs> you Do you have an idea when this movie came out? It's from, yeah, I think it's like late 80s, early 90s, but, it, 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 you know, I, I, I'm not too sure, but it's somewhere around there because I saw it when I was pretty young, um, and I, I'm just trying to remember what this is. So, hey, if anybody can figure this out, look, I'm not going to pay your bills just yet. I can't do that. I can't do it. But I, w I will do something special for you, all right? Nate the Fool will make you something i will do something but and you know this one might be too hard but we'll see somebody so, might figure it out and i will be honest i will be to totally honest i won't be like oh that's not it i'll be like no if you figure it out then hey so do you think that this film is a direct to video do you think it's a tv movie like is there anything else uh, yeah it could possibly be direct to video or you know, a lot of things did go into theaters back in the day. It's just maybe they just didn't get a lot of coverage. But um, from what I can recall, it wasn't like this super low budget thing. But yeah, if it was TV, it was like made for Cinemax or something. I know I always go to Cinemax, so, but it was... You know. So the voice sounded weird, like silly weird yeah, just, or... Like her voice got really deep like this when and, she would like start seducing men. And it was just. It was and weird. this all took place in the period, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't yeah, just a yeah. flash like forward or whatever. Two, three hundred years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. Now, going back to your disposal movie, how did you figure it out? I think I typed it in and, you know. And then it I just popped up. Got lucky. <laughs> or, you know, actually, I think I was, no, I was looking for something else. And it, I, it gave me this list of movies. I don't remember what the connection was, but then I got to it and I saw a picture of the actress and I was like, huh, eh, she seems familiar. And then I read the description and I was like, whoa, yes, this is it. But it was a lamp. 
I don't know. Evil lamp. Who knew? That's funny. Okay, well, I'll I'll try and think of whatever it is that you might be thinking of too. But okay, very good. Uh, a little update as well. This dates back to our very first episode. We were talking about remakes and reboots that are coming up in the future. And I believe this was one of the last ones that I brought up was the Little Shop of Horrors remake that they're going to do for film. And I had speculated who I thought were chosen for uh, Seymour and, and Audrey. So I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and then through those conversations we were talking about certain actors and then bam, it hit me. Oh, I forgot. They already did cast and these are who it's going to be. So it's not Josh Gad and Rebel Wilson as our two main stars. It is Taron Edgerton and Scar jo. Oh, okay, right. I <sighs> Taron. Taron Edgerton is um rocket man kingsman oh right okay got it got it got it okay okay i'm with you and it's really funny that i forgot this fact because when i heard about taryn being cast as seymour and i am very protective over this movie and its parts I was really irritated over the fact that Taron got nom- got nominated, got casted for this role because he is a beautiful, buff, pretty person. And that is not who Seymour is. I don't know exactly how this character is going to change to fit him. And he just is not the type to play this down-on-his-luck gentleman who is so gullible and you know, easily manipulated to be sort of, it just, it just doesn't work for me. He can sing and it's not like in the original Seymour glowed up, right? So how are they going to make this man look any less beautiful than he already is? Which then also scares me that I wonder if this movie is going to be taken out of its grittiness and just glamorized to just be beautiful New York or wherever it took place, Skid Row, and just... It, it, I'm just a little worried. I'm not, you know, everybody can trip over ScarJo all they want, but it, for me, it's it's Seymour. Seymour is a very important character, and I just don't think he's the right singer to do it. That's so funny. I'm not worried about him. I, I'm worried about her because yeah. I just don't see her being able to throw her voice. Well, I think she's just going to do her normal voice. And she, well, I mean, I'm not going to expect carbon copies of these characters if she doesn't I don't have want the a carbon accent. copy. But I just want, I don't know. She, if she's not going to do know. the accent, that's fine. But I've seen her sing before. She can sing. Is she the best singer? No, but I've oh. seen her do it. So hmm. I, you know, well. I'm just I'm just worried about the look. I just want him to be portrayed as the character that I remember. And there's no reason to change him. It, You know, we're still seeing this play on stage. And they're making another one for the stage. They've never changed the character, and I, you know, he might as well play the dentist, who, by the way, is Chris Evans. <laughs> All right. And I love that casting. That is brilliant. Right. I love that. But America's I'm a little... Ass. <laughs> but I'm a little questionable about that. So that's my update with Little Shop of Horror. So what do you think about that? Better, worse than the other two? We'll see. I was definitely like not super hyped about West Side Story, but then I saw that trailer and I was like, well, yeah, all right, that does look pretty good. So I will try my best to see what happens. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not against remakes. Yes, it's one of my childhood favorites. Um, I don't know. Black Widow getting her ass beat. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Well, her and Chris Evans have done so so many projects together and i'm not just talking about marvel they work yeah. together all the time so that pairing makes sense i don't know if that was the point but i can see chris evans handling her ass just just you know with the backhand like seriously <laughs> i just want to hear scar joe just be like yes doctor that's all i want to hear if she can pull that off i am kind of okay <laughs> I- i'm sure it'll be fun it'll be fun yeah yeah, yeah. So while we're on this subject, just to throw it in there, I'm sure everybody is aware of this by now. Hocus Pocus 2 
it is solidified. It's true. It's happening. No more rumors. No more what ifs. Our women are back. The Sanderson sisters, OGs, are in this movie. Into what capacity, we do not know. But you heard it from all three of them. They are officially on, and it's on Disney Plus Fall 2022. What do you think? Yeah. (laughs) So happy. I I mean, honestly, like, look, I always loved the first one you know i I mean most kids i think probably did um such a weird thing that it just was not good when it came out people hated it but now it's like how could we live without it it wouldn't be halloween without it so whatever they do i don't care it's gonna be great i'm (laughs) gonna love it i don't care it's gonna be great yeah this is so i had tons of people tag me because they know that's my jam so immediately when they heard it they tagged me and i heard a lot of different stuff one person was like i don't know about this and i get it this movie has reached such heights especially from where it came from as a flop it's like what can they do right because Mm -hmm. a lot of people are going to expect this to be better or as good and to immediately have that magic right that spark i got it from the trailer i don't give a fuck what box office was saying i don't care what critics were saying this movie hit me hard on that first go right i wasn't a late bloomer i didn't need help i didn't need it to go to video i was there and Mm -hmm. a lot of people are expecting this to seriously be good but here's the thing if you trust disney fine But they are also the same ones that developed this flop that nobody saw. So you got to wonder exactly how big the fan base is and if they are capable of creating a good follow-up. Because one person said, as long as the movie doesn't suck. And I'm like, what does that even mean? You can't say that. He's like, just as long as they don't make a crappy film. I'm like, what is a crappy film? Like, I I didn't get it, right? I was like, you can't just say that. Like, what makes it crappy? Are they not in it as much? Do they have a stupid story? Like, do they not look good? What makes it crappy? What can they do, right? So there's all these different possibilities. And you know me. I have my own movie in my head. I just need a plot. I just need a plot. But I, I'm on I'm on a high right now. I, I'm not skeptical. I, I think this will be fun. It will not be as good as the, as the first. And I don't even know what that even means because the movie flopped, right? So I just know I, I'm just going to love it no matter what they do with it. I don't know if I want it to be the, the, the sequel book. I don't know if I want it to be that story. I thought it was a cute story, but I don't know if I want to see that. So we'll see. Yeah, and I didn't read it, but the and that was directly tied to the original kids, right? Like yes. they're adults now. Mm-hmm. And so what I read, I don't think they're going to be in the movie. I think it's a different set of girls that bring them back. That's what they said. Gotcha. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But yes, oh, I'm excited. But. Your one, like, long time ago, you said those three little girls that stole their brooms, It maybe it's, th- well, no, because they would be adults, but maybe it's their kids. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, we'll see. I Maybe the brooms have some, I don't know if the magic, who knows? I mean, the book's still out there. We'll, we'll see what they do with it. Adam Shankman was supposed to direct the sequel. He directed the Hairspray remake, and he bowed out because he's doing the sequel to Enchanted, Disenchanted. So they gave it to a, yeah. (laughs) So they gave it, oh, did you, oh, well, I mean, yeah, we're going way deep into, uh, let me pull, let me get out of the rabbit hole because I I can go into Disenchant it. But they gave it to a female director. Her name is Ann Fletcher. She did the proposal and 27 dresses. Okay. All right. I did not see either of those, but okay. I I'm aware. Yeah. I'm aware. And uh, David uh, Kirshner, uh, who was mm-hmm. producer of the first one, is still involved with this one. So we ha- still have some familiar faces who are involved. And of course, our three leading ladies are still in it. So, um, yeah, I just need a plot. Just need a plot. All right. It is that time of the episode. It is our episode trivia question for all of you. I am presenting to Nate this week. Great question last time, by the way, Nate. Thanks. Hair toss. 
By the end of Split 2016, how many personalities does Kevin Wendell <laughs> Crumb exhibit? <laughs> now, again, you don't have to answer now. We will reveal his answer as well as the uh, answer to the trivia question at the end of the episode. But he has all the rest of the episode to think about it. Do you remember Split? Yeah, I remember the movie. Sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, man, Split. What an experience in the theater this was. Oh, this was a great watch at the movies. Um, I enjoyed this. It was. It was good. Yeah. Uh, didn't know you were going to have me doing math, but <laughs> sure. I. It's a great movie, nonetheless. Anyone listening, just remember that this question is also posted on Twitter and our Instagram page. This is at Fear Bias on both platforms. If you happen to catch this trivia question while we're recording, reply, and then we will give you a shout out on the show if you happen to get it right. Now, again, we can't fault you for looking it up. It just means you're paying attention. You're having fun with us. That's what we want. We want the interaction, the communication. Check Twitter, check Instagram, see if you get it right. And then again, if you happen to hear your name when this episode posts, looks like you did it. I mean, you know, I'll be impressed because clearly I've already stated that I don't know how to search for things on Google. So <laughs> if you can find it. I kudos. have no idea either. I think this might be an easy lookup, but you have to really watch the movie and, and, and to know. So we'll see what people say. You know, people are trying to contribute to our content, Rob. One of our friends, Matt, sent me this funny little article. And I thought I would share it because it made me laugh. There is an agency out there called Texas Chain Paw with a P Massacre. <laughs> now, what this agency does is they specialize in finding animal lookalikes for pet adoption. So they'll go to different, uh, and this, this is two sisters. Um, they go to different shelters and they find animals that look like that creepy ass cat from Pet Cemetery, or um, the cat from Alien that she's running around with at the end. Um, so, or maybe Cujo, I don't know. And their tagline is saving animals one horror movie at a time. I thought it was cute. And it was worthy enough to to let people know you can you can find these. I don't, I don't remember where they're stationed, but um, Texas Chain Paw Massacre. If you're looking to adopt a animal doppelganger from your favorite horror movie, these ladies might be able to help you out. That's actually a really cute idea. And I love that it's two sisters who are doing this so into horror and Find, yeah. found out that there is an actual business in this. There, there are people out there who would love to have animals that look exactly like these uh, counterparts from these horror films. I think it's a nice idea. What popped in my head immediately, though, listening to this was like, oh, this is just like when kids get adopted and all they want is babies and they don't want teenagers. You know, <laughs> like, I just feel oh. like there's, you know, all of these non- you know, movie pets just don't get a home. But I will say, the husky dog from Lost Boys, I actually always wanted a husky because of that movie. I, I will say that. I, mm -hmm. I always loved that dog. And I'm trying to think of any others. I mean, I'm sure there are other famous, like, pets, not from horror films that I liked, but yes, there's definitely a few that I can think of from horror films that I think would be fun. Yeah. So, you know, and just like you said, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to, I want a puppy. I don't want to adopt a dog that, but it's like, this helps. Cause then it's like this tiny little niche market where it's like, oh, this dog, this dog was abandoned and they look like the dog from the thing, whatever. And somebody's like, you know, a big horror fan will be like, yes, I will absolutely take this dog in. They're six, seven years old. Um, so it is cute. It's cute and creepy. I definitely don't want that cat from Pet Cemetery though. I don't I, care I can't, how friendly no. it is. Nope, mm -hmm. I couldn't do nope. that. I couldn't do that. 
I'm I'm looking at their Instagram page right now, and yeah, it's just post after post <laughs> of the animals. Uh, some with their you know pets and customers, others just images from the films that they are referring to. They don't even stop at movies; they do TV. Uh, Justin Eccles from Supernatural holding a dog. Uh, <laughs> oh, I got one. <laughs> so, would you prefer the cat from Hocus Pocus or the cat from Tales from the Dark Side? Oh, well, I'll take the Hocus Pocus cat. Yeah, definitely. Oh, no, no. That's pretty cool. I like that. I, it's a nice idea. I don't think anybody else has done something like that. So, yeah, very yeah. clever. I, I don't know if there's an animal that I would, like, truly, truly want, but I think that's still cool. Yeah, it'd have to be one of the friendly animals. <laughs> Warns me that the ghost is in the house. Right? Yeah. Nate, so small little thing that I caught since our last recording. This was on Instagram, and it was so random, but I had caught a live, or maybe it was a post. No, it was a post Mm -hmm. of this gentleman, Tim Capello. I don't know if you know him by name. Definitely not. You do? Yeah. Um, He is the gentleman who sang that song i still believe on the lost boys Mm -hmm. remember when they were at the fair or the carnival or whatever yeah and there's that jazzed up you know saxophone player shirt off he's just pumping up the audience everybody i first of all to this day i still listen to that song i love that song it's one of my favorites on my playlist i listen to all the time really and uh yeah no i i i find the song to be fun But Tim Capello posted a video of him telling the story about how he got that part. And I found that really interesting. I wanted to share with you. Mm -hmm. So apparently he was on the Warner Brothers lot and he was auditioning for a movie. He tried to get the villain Gary Busey part from Lethal Weapon. So he did not get the part, unfortunately, but someone recognized him in the lobby and was like, hey, you're that guy who goes in on tour and sings with Tina Turner. And he goes, yeah, that's me. So he took him to the office of his boss. And in this office sits Joel Schumacher. And Joel Schumacher in his office has a picture of him on his wall in the back of him. So Schumacher <laughs> is apparently a fan of Tim Capello. And so Joel was like, hey, do you want to maybe sing a song and do a small part in the lost boys. And it only took about two to three minutes and bam, he's in the movie. 33 years later, he's still singing. The song is what he said. He even played a little bit of his sax and sang the lyric. And yeah, I just thought that was a really nice story to hear because something as small as that. And it does stand out in the movie. People do not forget the saxophone player from that movie. So it was nice to kind of hear how he got it. It's true, yeah. I I didn't know him by name, but I do remember that scene and saxophone, very 80s. Especially played by this gigantor of a man, you know? (laughs) just sweat, oil dripping all over the place, yeah. Right? I still like that song, though. That song's cool. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of share that with everyone. And if you're interested in looking at the video yourself, I will have a link to this Instagram post in the uh, notes of the episode. Very nice. Very sweet story. Mr. Scholar, I have taken it upon myself to put a little challenge out there. I'm not an inherently evil person. Really not. But I feel like I kind of come off that way. Kind of like it, kind of don't. Just depends on what day it is. However, I thought it would be good for my ego if I could choose a film that I've had some harsh feelings about in the past and pay it a compliment. I'm going to choose a movie. Moving forward, if you feel the uh, spirit move you and you think, hey, I remember when he said he hates this fucking movie, I want to rub it in his face right now and challenge him to say something nice about it. You okay. can do that. I you I, you know me. I'll do it. You I know, know you I will. will. Always call that shit out. And I know. here's the thing: 
you are everyone is right to their own opinion of a movie good or bad if you don't like it if you do like it whatever nobody Mm. should challenge you to change your mind or anything like that but sometimes it could come off a little cynical so that's what i'll listen for you know where you're just like there has to be something and you know even if it's down to like at least the plot was interesting. That's why I watched it. Like, that's something good. Like, something. anything. You now, know? I mean, that's not always the case. <laughs> Let's yeah. just be honest. But, hey, I'm going to show you right now. In the 2004 film Van Helsing, I really appreciate the costume design and the wigs. <laughs> Great work. Especially uh, the, the brides in particular. Love, love, love their wig work. And that's all I have to say. Okay, here's here's what just popped in my head with that. I would have conversations with, with guys on like apps, you know, people I'm meeting or talking to or whatever. And, you know, it's no secret that I am a fan of horror movies. Do you have to be fans of horror movies? No, not 100%. Not like I do. It, it's not like a red flag or anything. It would benefit if you did, but you don't have to be into it. My thing is, when you are having a conversation with a gentleman that you're getting to know, and you want to keep things positive, fresh, you want to keep the conversation going, you don't want to come off negative or cynical, let's say you hear something that you may not want to hear. Oh, the dude you're talking to is into horror, but you're not into horror. You don't have to blatantly just be like, I don't like horror. Because that tells me you don't like something that I am really interested in. And there is a difference between not liking something and just having not as much interest. Because you know what I do when I hear something about a topic that I don't like or don't understand? I still engage and find out why they're into it. It keeps the conversation going And it allows the other person to express their likeness for something they find important. So if I told you, Nate, I think Van Helsing is a good movie, you could be like, I think it's garbage. Where am I supposed to go with that? But if you had came to me and been like, but you know what? That costume design was cool. It shows you are paying attention. It shows you are engaged in a topic that I want to talk about. And you're finding something positive about something to further let me know that you're not a dick. So, I mean. So, I don't know why you are getting so harsh right now, but I just gave you all the sugar and spice I can. Okay? No, no, no. I'm not using you as a complete example. I'm just using what you no. had said nice about and the film. And that's why I'm doing this. other people can say. You know, and it's it's like a good improv lesson for people. You know, like what's one of the rules of improv? Whenever like someone introduces something, you always say yes. <laughs> Instead of like, no, the wall is not there. It's like, yes. So, you know, finding the positive. Um, it doesn't always happen. It's not like you can't have opinions. I still have opinions. This is just one of those moments where I'm trying something different. That's all. Don't worry. In about five minutes, I'm sure I'll find something that I fucking hate. Don't you worry. (laughs) No, that's fine. And, you know, sometimes I get accused of giving too much benefit of the doubt to movies that clearly don't deserve it. And I always say that whatever I don't like, somebody loves every single time. And, you know, we talked about this on the other show. I had said every movie has at least one fan. You were like, no, that's not true. I mean, and look, it's hard to prove, but it's hard to prove. Well, no, you know what? You're right. The people who made these movies, I think they're fans. The person who wrote it, the person who directed it, they made it. They loved it. They they put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. So yeah, they're a fan. There you go. You're right. You're right, Rob. There's always one fan. One. Yes. <laughs> well, I will definitely I'm definitely up for this challenge. I'll keep an eye out for that. So yes, be ready. I'll call it out. And I'll I'll say this, Van Helsing, no. I'm not I don't know her. I, I I'm I just can't. <gasps> now I I'll do a rewatch and I mm. could change my mind to have the fun of it because look, Steven Sommers did the mummy with Brandon Fraser and I fucking love it. Yeah. 
And I was so excited to be like, wow, he's tackling another monster movie. He's going to bring that same flair and magic. And I just could not get into Van. I couldn't do it. You even brought me Celine and it still didn't work. I, I don't know. So it deserves a rewatch, but at the moment, I'm not a fan. Can't do it. So we'll see. I respect that. So I guess we've arrived at the meat of our conversation. And, uh, you know, there's just been a lot of things coming at us this week as far as TV is concerned. Not this week, but this month, whatever. There's a lot of stuff on TV. Um, and whether it's like new or old, I thought we could uh, share a little bit about what we're watching and maybe it'll inspire some of you to check out these things. Or maybe you've already watched all of them. I don't know. Like, get some hobbies. Anyway, I have been watching something called Sweet Home. And it came out last year, but I sat on it for a while. And it's a Korean horror drama. And, you know, it. I think I sat on it because it's like, one of those post-apocalyptic things. I can't really do too much of that right now. I gotta like, it's, you know, you, you gotta measure it out. But quick synopsis, a uh, group of people are in this apartment building. They kind of lock themselves in because outside the entire world, people are be, being infected and they're turning into monsters, all kinds of monsters. And they're almost impossible to kill. So the different thing about this is that they're not being bitten or it's not like this airborne virus. People are being infected by desire. And if they have a strong desire for whatever, it'll infect them and they'll start showing symptoms and they might turn into a monster that wants to eat everyone. But almost done with it. It's pretty gruesome. Not for the faint of heart. And uh, if you're still, like, on some heavy feelings about this past year of being in quarantine, proceed with caution. So I have this on my queue, and I love the poster artwork for it. That, that cover art really grabs you. Uh, they do show a small little scene, and, I yeah, it definitely seemed pretty creepy. I... Didn't know it was post-apocalyptic, so I think that's really interesting. I haven't watched it yet because I thought that it was all subtitles. Like, you couldn't dub it. So tell me, can you can you dub this into English? I watched it in the original Korean. I do believe that you can dub it, though. I, I, I think all the Netflix originals can be dubbed. And actually, no, no, that's right. When I first started it, it was dubbed. It automatically did it. And I just, I don't know, I just didn't like it. Once in a while, it's fine, but it just was a little off. So I was like, no, I'd rather just let them use their original language and I can read the subtitles. It's fine. Very good. Yeah, lately, if I'm watching TV, I'm usually paired with me editing or, or doing something to where I can't fully just concentrate on the television. And so... I haven't really been in that mood to just do nothing but watch TV because what will probably happen is I'll fall asleep. But Sweet Home sounds so interesting. And hearing you talk about what it actually is makes me even more excited to watch. So that will definitely be something that gets upped on the queue a little higher. So that's awesome. It's a good one. For me, one of the shows that I'll bring up just real quickly is that I finished the Supernatural series. I, oh. when, when they posted the last season on Netflix, I went back to to kind of finish where I left off because I hadn't watched it in a couple of years. It only it turns out I was only two seasons behind. I thought I was like four or five, but mm -hmm. I had watched all the way up to season 13 and <laughs> um, it went to season 15. So I just rewatched 13 just to kind of like get back into it and figure out where I left off. And then I watched the rest of it and binged it. And I haven't really heard much reception on how they ended it, but they definitely ended it. 
I, I was happy with it. I still had a lot of fun with this series going back to it. Uh, it was a hard watch for me to watch weekly. So yeah. that's why I gave up back in the day. And as far as the big bad and everything that was going on, they found ways to keep the danger and the whole world saving going. Uh, and it's not as good as some of the first years or whatnot that went through, but they still kept the humor. They still kept the chemistry. The gang got a little bigger, and I love the storylines they had with that. One character in particular did a complete 180 and went from bad to good, and I love this character. It's like it's one of my favorite characters of this entire series, and I'll definitely praise this character. I don't want to give anything away, which is why I'm being so cryptic, but uh, the Supernatural series all, always came with great special effects and everything. I think the series ended well. I, I enjoyed it. I'm still going to remember it, and I still recommend it to people, too. So that's what I've been watching lately is that when I finished that. Cute, cute. Well, speaking of finishing shows, I did indeed binge Castlevania, pretty much. Um, I watched it in two or three days, and the episodes are not long. You know, they're like a half hour, but it is finished, and... I know I was a little concerned whether or not things would wrap up. You know, not going to give anything away, but I'm happy with where it landed. And whether or not they do a spinoff, I'm satisfied. But great animation, great story, extremely violent. So violent, my goodness. It's over now, and thanks for the last four years. Well, now that the show is finally closed, I will have more of a like a casual watch for me to just kind of binge this whenever I can and not feel the pressure of keeping up. But it is something that I hope to watch one day. Uh, it, it sounds interesting and you make it sound interesting. So the fact that it's also adult will be pretty cool to watch. I think it's well written. I think you'll enjoy it. The other series that I kind of wanted to highlight that's been sort of in this horror-esque sort of category is the unfortunate cancel of prodigal son now this is currently airing on fox right now and i should know better because i remember back (laughs) in our old series we went through this and we were talking about how fox be canceling shit left and right especially on the horror stuff they just Mm -hmm. don't know Mm -hmm. how to advertise for it and keep it on payroll and so This is something that's been going on lately with uh, some shows, and this happened to be a product of it, is that they cancel shows and announce it without even telling their cast because they don't want anyone to find out about it. Because if you knew a show canceled before the rest of their season aired, some people would just be like, fuck it. Why watch it if there's not going to be a continuation? So they waited until they officially wrapped And they had two episodes left. And then they announced it that they weren't going to bring it back for a third season. And the cast was like, what the fuck? But Kim's Convenience did the exact same thing to their cast. And so the entire cast were bummed, especially Lou Diamond Phillips. Like He was like, I had no idea what the hell, right? Yeah. Prodigal... Prodigal Son starred Tom Paine, who you may know as Jesus from the Walking Dead series. And he left that show to pursue his own thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he plays a detective whose father is a well-known serial killer who is currently locked up in asylum. And the show kind of chronicles him solving cases because he is a profiler since his dad was a serial killer. And it also highlights the possibility that he may be a chip off the old block. Uh Is he as crazy as his father? Does he have homicidal tendencies, yada, yada? But he also still has a relationship with his dad as sometimes the dad will help him solve cases. And I loved this show. I thought it was so good. And it also had some humor into it. Tom Payne, of course, super charming, super gorgeous, and he just has this effect on people, I think, to just reel them in and watch him on screen, and 
after the first season, it ended on such a high note. It was like, what are they going to do? And then the second season came and it got a little gimmicky and, and comical, more comical. But at the same time, I thought the storylines were elevating and I thought the characters were being more developed and I enjoyed it more than the first season. But unfortunately, they decided to cancel it. The type of cases, the kills, the effects, everything screamed thriller. And I thoroughly enjoyed this and I'm so sad that it got canceled. Uh, And unfortunately, the series ended on a cliffhanger. Oh, yeah, that's the worst. That is such the worst, but I just want to highlight Prodigal Son. I think the show was awesome, and, you know, it sucks that, you know, Fox canceled it. Could it get saved by other stuff? Who knows? But, yeah, good run, I thought. I am also watching Them on Amazon Prime. Can't do it. my roommate. I can't recommend it, not because it's a bad show, it's very well done from everything you know the directing the writing the casting visually i mean it's very cinematic i cannot necessarily recommend it to my black friends and anytime i tell them about it i'm like you know just be prepared it's it's not a easy watch it's not like you're you know sometimes you watch a horror movie and it's like it's over the top or it's like, I, you know, it's a little thrill. But this one is, it's very serious. Um, there is a lot of supernatural things happening. Um, but the main terrorizing element is, you know, evil racist white people. And my goodness, whenever you have actors portraying evil racist white people, they're so good. And it's They're so disturbing. good at it, aren't they? They are just I, letting all of it out. Uh, It's so easy to just be nasty. Well, that's why actors love playing villains. They love playing the bad guys. They get to do something that they don't normally, you know, express or get out of their system. I'm not saying we're inherently all evil, but it is a change of pace when you can just be like, fuck you, Karen, or whatever. Like, you just want to be able to say that one day without consequence. And And it is fun. It's fun to be a villain, but it's not like Loki or, you know... Thanos it's it's different it's not even like Michael Myers it's it's a it's another level so it it's then this is not a binge show uh, you know it's like yeah you probably need a break one episode yeah after and even I don't remember which episode it was but I knew something was going to happen to the lead actress and I was watching it with my roommate Brandy and I just fast forwarded um because I just could kind of tell it was coming. And I said, we, we don't need to watch this part. And you can you can say what you want to say. But I was like, no, I'm not going to sit here and watch this. And my roommate Brandy, she's a black woman. And I was like, I don't, I just don't, <laughs> I just don't want to do it. Okay, um, so white person, what are you getting out of this series? Why are you watching it? What is it entertaining? Like, what's the point she wanted of to watch it. Um, and she was really upset that a lot of people um, have been condemning it without watching it a lot of people have been saying like this is not what i want i'm not going to deal with this which i understand but she wanted to watch it so it's like you know it's like a roommate activity she really wanted to watch a tv show so we're watching this i'm watching it for the acting basically i mean it like i said everything is well done um but it is it's very uncomfortable and honestly yes as a white person this is probably something that white people should watch you know it's like black people don't need to watch it because they they already know about it a lot of white people will sweep things under the rug and like oh it's old it's in the past but it's like well you know look at what happened from your grandparents era or even your parents era it's like you know they were little kids they were around when things like this were happening and i mean i i keep you know waiting for the supernatural element to sort of culminate in this uh, big thing but it's it's pretty subtle not subtle but it's just you know it's like it's not as prevalent as the experience of moving into this neighborhood with crazy white people i'm not against watching you know well-written 
stuff and, and if it's acted very well that's great also I like to be entertained when I watch television. You know, I, I don't necessarily put my neck out to watch documentaries and, and all of mm-hmm. these like biopics and, and reasons of learning history through film. I think that's the best way for me to learn stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what that says about me, but at the same time, there is sort of a cup that has filleth up all the way. And after Antebellum, after Lovecraft Country, like I'm tapped. I'm yeah. tapped. And if you want me to walk out of this hating white people even more, then, you know, I can watch this movie for that. I just don't see the heavy importance of watching this from an entertainment point of view. Now, mm-hmm. if you want to learn a little bit about history, that's fine. And maybe the supernatural element is opening the doors up for other types of audience as a allegory or a metaphor. I get that as well. But are these people tapping into what's cool now, which is exploiting all of this hate for not necessarily a cash grab, but to be recognized as successful filmmakers and, and, and you know... TV making like I just I'm not saying that we're being used but at Mm -hmm. the same time like Amazon Prime has another you know show out called uh, you know the underground underground railroad and it's just like how many of these do we need to get the not the point I'm not saying just stop because look I mean our story can definitely be told in different ways and it needs to you know be told or whatnot but there's more to black lives than just what we're struggling with. And I just don't see myself having fun with this show. So I hate to be one of those people that is not watching it and still making a judgment, but I'm not telling anybody not to watch it. I'm just saying this is not for me today. Yeah. I mean, it's no, it's, it's definitely very heavy. Um, If you're going to do it, proceed with caution. That's that's the reason why we're watching it, because a lot of people have been having the same reaction that you are and saying, like, I can't keep doing this right now, um, especially with the way the world is and what what has been going on within the last year. They're like, I I need a little bit more distraction. Can you tell me if this show is scary at all or is there just a supernatural uh... element brought on by a heavy dramatic story? It has its moments. I mean, there's definitely been some jump scares and, you know, it's, it is creepy because each family member is experiencing their own thing. There's definitely some little like jump scare moments and some creepy looking specters in the corner. <laughs> well, besides Vampire Diaries, the final season, I'll, I'll finish it someday. You know, I promise. Um... I am watching Haunted, and it's like a reality show. Um, they came out with where, another season, right, just now? Yeah, it just came out, and I'm almost done. I have one more episode, and it's basically just people apparently recounting a true story, something that actually happened to them, and there's reenactments by actors. It's I don't know. I watch it because I'm fascinated. Is it real are these really real people telling stories or are we getting that fourth kind sort of thing sort of yeah because <laughs> you, you know it's like the way that a lot of the people tell the stories now and i'm not saying you have to be like this sobbing mess but it's like they seem like they're reading a script right <laughs> sort of or it's like they're doing this really like they're sort of improving like the way that they say things it's it's not I don't know. It's like, I can't tell if they're just like very calm or they're like kind of shell shocked. Like, you know, this happened to me 30 years ago, but it's like, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell. And then one of the issues people had in the past with, I think maybe the first season is that they could not find any sort of information about these stories. Cause one of them, it was like, these two girls grew up in a house where their parents were serial killers. And then there were like bodies buried all over the the property and it was like there's no investigation like this after someone tells this story you would think somebody would be like oh well we need to go and like go to this property and dig up the bodies and identify like what we can 
And I even, you know, it's like, I believe in supernatural things happening sometimes. I, I'm not like so skeptical that if someone tells me there's a ghost in the house, I'm not going to believe them. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm open-minded to that, but I just can't tell. I just can't tell. So now it's like at this point, I'm, I'm in it, so I have to watch it. Nice. I I did see a clip of it. I, I didn't know it was going to be reenacted by actors. So it's nice to be able to visually see sort of the story that's being told. So that gives me a little bit of um, motivation to check out the series uh, one day. I honestly thought it was about haunted houses and not in the general sense, but like the created ones that you uh, see everywhere. Oh, you know? I see. Okay. So that's what I thought it was. I didn't know it was just you know, hauntings and, and just reenactments. So yeah, it sounds cool. And this is currently on Netflix, correct? Yeah. Third season just came out. There's six episodes. This one that I just watched lately, it's not necessarily uh, just horror. It, it's more of a suspense thriller and a little bit of sci-fi. And I've recommended it to a couple of people. I don't know what this says. I haven't heard back from them. So maybe they tried it, didn't get into it. Who knows? But this is a TV show that is on Netflix. They've only done one season, and I believe they were uh, good to go for a season two. This is a series called Alice in Borderland, right? And it's and a Japanese. About this. Yes, it's it's a Japanese show. Uh, I believe it was created from uh, a manga. They do have an animated counterpart series, I believe, that was made as well. Uh, I haven't seen it because I don't have access to it, but from what I've seen, the animated scenes that I've seen have also been carried out in this live action series. And so basically, uh, there's this gamer. He's very obsessed with gaming, but he sort of just sucks at everything else. Like he's kind of lazy. He's like a man child. He doesn't want to like get a job and like take care of himself and be an adult. Well, he and two other friends, he they find themselves in this strange sort of emptied out version of Tokyo. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can get more into detail how it happens, but they sort of go into hiding from the cops. And while they're hiding, something happens. And when they come out, Tokyo is just gone. It's just empty. They seem to be sort of the only people left there. But they are given a lot of hints and signs to go to a specific location. Now, when they get there, they find that there are other people that are living and still there in so-called Tokyo, but everything has changed. And now they have to play a game. All of these people, people including these three friend, friends have to compete in these dangerous games in order to survive so just think saw-ish with a bit of hunger games right and these games can challenge you on wit on your you know smarts athleticism your ambition and desire to survive it gets heavy and it gets bloody and I don't think there's any way for you to really play these games without betraying your friends <laughs> and they get into it. So just as an example, the very first thing that happens is they approach the location. Everybody has to decide if they're going to play the game or not before time runs out. And then there is a playing card that whatever number it, it says on the card represents the difficulty level. Being one is the easiest and then ace and whatnot are the highest, right? And so they go into this game. They're locked in a room. They have 60 seconds to choose from three doors to make it to the next room. If they pick the wrong door, dead. So they have to figure out how to pick the right door because there is a way to figure it out. And it's just... If, and if they don't pick within 60 seconds, bam, the whole room goes up in flames. So they got to be quick with this. And the fact that this guy's a gamer helps with solving these games and ways of figuring it out and staying alive. But as the show progresses in each episode, you find that there is a bigger thing to this and that if you play enough of these games, you actually may be able to win to get out and it it's so good it is so good 
I, I would say that there are some definite creepy moments in this, but I think it stems more on the idea of of human nature and instinct and how people turn to each on each other and just being able to survive. But it's heavy on the gore. It's heavy on the traps. It's heavy on the games. I think it's super creative. It's fun. Visually, there's nice effects. It's colorful. You know how Japanese shows are. I definitely recommend this. And man, did it get really heavy towards the end because if you're fully invested in these characters by the last episode, which I think is like 10 episodes this season, it's it's heavy. It's really, really good. And um, yeah, I definitely recommend this. So that's pretty much the latest horror-esque TV show that I've been watching lately. I also watched a film on Shudder. See, I'm using it more <laughs> as suggested. Look at you. I know. Look at you. <laughs> I finally, I don't know. Well, actually, I do know why it took me so long to watch it. But I finally broke the seal and watched Hell House LC, LLC. Oh, I don't. Yeah, when you posted something about this, I was like, I've never heard of this, I don't think. So it's part of a trilogy. Um, all of them are out now. And Hell House is, was sort of like the Blair Witch of haunts. And mm. it was basically okay. this fictional, you know, found footage story about this hotel that was used to, that was turned into a, a haunted house for Halloween and the crew and everybody who was fixing it all up just went through some heavy stuff that went on inside. And the way that it was filmed was very much like Blair Witch. Like, if they had put this movie out when Blair Witch came out and claimed that it was real and that whole craze of, like, is this really happening, you know? Because we all thought Blair Witch yeah. was, was it back then and thought yeah, that we, crap was real. We were so dumb. I know, but so I dumb. went there and I was like, hell yeah, that's just real. But if they had did this for Hell House at that time, I would have believed 100% everything I saw. And I love, that's one of the big things I like about that movie was that they really made it look like this, this shit was going down. And yeah, it is to me, I think one of the best found footage horror films that I've seen. And it, it's got me very curious but yeah, I thought the scares were authentic. There was a specific clown that kept popping up in in different spots oh. and that that was enough for me. Like there were times where I was like covering my mouth. I'm like, oh, oh, no, no, that's not good. But the rest of it was actually pretty like somber. Like th there were definitely a lot hmm. of creepy things going on. It felt a little repetitive as far as the tactics of scares that they were using. But overall, I, I do enjoy the story and I would recommend this to people too. Uh, it's currently on Shudder and hopefully soon I'll be able to watch some of the sequels. It is time to come back to our trivia question. And we'll see if Nate knows the answer. So again, I asked him, by the end of Split from 2016, how many personalities does Kevin Wendell Crumb exhibit? Uh, you kind of hinted that you may not know this answer, but take a guess. How many do you think he had by the end of the movie? Oh, I got a guess. Twelve. Twelve. Okay, I was going to say twenty, because we don't necessarily get to see them all but i know that there was talk of them and i think his psychiatrist even said an official number on how many he had i checked online it looks like nobody got the answer correctly on twitter what about instagram i didn't let me see oh mm, i haven't had no no okay so let's see if any one of us was correct so the correct answer is 24 whatever right. <laughs> 24 personalities that's crazy look i don't remember okay <laughs> but great movie nonetheless that's our trivia for episode four and remember keep an eye out for uh, notifications on our stories on instagram and also on twitter we'll be posting our next trivia question the next time we get together to record episode five and if you happen to know the answer to the trivia question just reply and we'll give you a shout out on the show i guess it's time to wind down with another 
bitch really? Last night, I took it upon myself to watch Urban Legend. Yes, Urban Legend. And you know, Rob, never really been a fan. I'm still not. <laughs> <sighs> but you know, it's very 90s, so it was fun. My bitch really is <laughs> from the scene when Alicia Witt is in the car with Joshua Jackson. He gets out to go and pee. You know, there's a tree. There was a perfectly good tree, like 10 feet away from the car. But he wanders off into the woods. Like, he goes really far away to pee. Because it's small. That's why. <laughs> I mean, but she wasn't checking for him. Bitch. Really? Uh, like, where were you going? Where was he going? I don't know. I don't know. But then, sorry to hit you with the double. So obviously the killer's going to come and grab him. There's this whole thing where Alicia Witt is trying to start the car because this parka killer's trying to come and kill her. And then all of a sudden, she hears something scraping on the roof of the car. What is it? It's Pacey's shoes. Pacey, Joshua Jackson, whatever. Look, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, he's Pacey name. to me. Bitch, really? You expect me to believe that this killer somehow got his rope up over a tree and over this car and Alicia Witt didn't notice shit? And, spoiler alert, if y'all haven't seen Urban Legend at this point, I, I don't know what to tell you, but the killer is Rebecca Gayhart, the Noxzema girl. You expect me to believe that the Noxzema girl <laughs> lifted Noxzema girl. up Joshua Jackson and got him over the roof of a car? Don't even try to explain, oh, well, she attached to the back of the car. The car hadn't been moved yet. Alicia Witt didn't move him. Sometimes rage can just enhance the body and its muscles and, and just give you that extra electrolyte to just strength up and just get somebody over a tree, okay. <laughs> over a car. All right. So yeah, you're telling she people... had she had him hanging to the point where his feet were barely touching the roof of the car. Now I'm sure there was like a big bang to where he got on the car, and then she maybe pulled the rope to the point of him kind of touching it. So that's the only thing that I can think of. I can't remember if there was like a big bang on the car, and she just didn't know what to do, but. There's no way he like she like threw him over the tree branch and <laughs> and then pulled him up. She had to have thrown the rope over the branch and then pulled him up. But him getting on the car, that's a different story. Alicia's just so self-absorbed. Like she ain't noticing shit, you know? So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm not having it. There's a lot of questionable moments for sure in that scene. Mm. I mean for the urban legend, I mean, that's why it's an urban legend, right? Because how the fuck did that happen anyway? <laughs> mm. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. That's going to do it for us, kids. Thanks for sticking it out. Definitely. I'm Rob the Scholar. This is Bitch I Ain't Scared. I am Nate the Fool. And uh, we love you. Bye-bye.